Hi, everybody. This is Pastor Alex Lepos of the House, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Today, we're going to be looking at a rather short chapter, Revelation 15, but it's packed with beautiful, beautiful revelation. And I'm going to ask John Cardos to open up in prayer. Turn on your microphone, John. Okay, John. Good. Go ahead. Uh, oh, Lord, how we've needed you this week and how we've needed you during these times, Lord with all the frustration and all the conflict that's going on in the world and in our lives. Lord, we ask for your, the love that you, that you said would be ours from you, the security that you were going to give us as we, as we turn to you and, and seek your face. Lord, we seek your face and we seek the revelation that, that means things to us, that uh, opens the doors of, uh, of, of our, our understanding. Lord, I, I ask you to bless everyone who is listening now, Lord, because and, and, and give us what we need to hear. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, John. Today we're going to start off by resuming the video on the 27 signs that the last days are upon us. Last week, we got up to sign number 13, and today we're going to look at sign 14 to about 20. And then next week, we'll finish it off. We'll go from 21 to 27. So here are signs 14 to 20 of the signs of the last days. Here we go. Number 14, good is evil. And evil is good. Traditional marriage, bad. Gay marriage, good. Male and female, bad. Gender diversity, good. Truth, bad. Lying, good. Truth is the new hate speech. Here we have a picture of the Drag Queen Story Hour being held in many of our public schools. This would actually be hilarious if it wasn't so pathetically evil. These people cannot reproduce so they recruit in our schools, corrupting our children and grandchildren. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, will inherit the kingdom of God. I use the New King James Bible here because the word homosexual did not exist in 1611 when they published the original King James Bible. The word homosexual was coined in the mid-19th century, in Germany, that's why it's in many of your modern Bibles, with the exception of the NIV, which is a homosexual friendly Bible. Jesus had a particular harsh word for these people in Luke chapter 17, verse 2. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea that he should offend one of these little ones. If you have children or grandchildren in the public school system, then you need to check on what they're being taught. Ensure that they are not being corrupted by folks like these. There's a special place in the lake of fire reserved for those that corrupt little children. Number 15, Israel at war. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says Israel at war after Hamas launches surprise attack. Hamas launched a surprise attack against Israel on Saturday morning, October 7th which began with Hamas terrorists killing Jewish women, children, babies, and soldiers. Israel's response was slow, with jets attacking targets across Gaza, followed by a ground assault. Matthew 24, verse 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. I added this slide because this current war could lead to the peace treaty or covenant signed by the Antichrist and many nations. If that could be the case, then the seven-year tribulation would then begin 
meaning the rapture would be even sooner. Number 16, digital currency, mark of the beast technology. The World Economic Forum has declared that all citizens must be implanted with a CBDC microchip in the very near future to fully participate in society and do basic things such as purchase food and water. CBDC stands for Central Bank Digital Currency. According to Professor Richard Warner, in the very near future, citizens will need to use the latest technology, such as the CBDC chip implant, to access their bank accounts. Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 and 17. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. I've always had an issue with the mark of the beast being a microchip. Number one, there is no religious or spiritual association or connotation with a microchip. Number two, why would it be in the forehead? The forehead is a terrible place to try to put a chip implant because the skin is so thin. Your right hand would be okay, but certainly not your forehead. The word mark is the Greek word karagma. It means a stamp, imprint, brand, or badge of servitude. I like the badge of servitude idea because that easily could carry a religious association. Remember, those that take the mark of the beast align themselves with the Antichrist, thus condemning themselves to the lake of fire. So are there people today that wear something on their forehead that has a religious connotation? Yes, there are. These are Hamas fighters wearing the green headband of Hamas. There's writing on that green headband and also on the green flags in the background. And that writing says there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. When you see this green headband, you immediately know you are looking at Muslims that follow their prophet Muhammad and worship the moon god Allah. Notice the new uniforms and equipment, including those new AK-47s. Guess who paid for that? Well, we did, the American taxpayer. We have funded a United Nations group called UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian refugees in the Near East. The Palestinians are the only refugee people on earth that have their own personal United Nations agency. In recent weeks, it was discovered that some members of UNRWA actually participated in the Hamas invasion of Israel and that others actually held Jewish hostages. The Biden administration, along with several other countries, has recently cut off all funding to UNRWA. But Hamas is not the only group that wears a headband identifying them to a particular religion. Hezbollah fighters wear a yellow headband that reads, The Party of Allah. Iranian fighters wear a red headband that says, The Innocent the martyrs. This is a martyr's headband of all those that have died for the cause of Allah. Here's an interesting photograph of children wearing the red headband of uh, Iran, the martyr's headband. Now this picture was not taken in a school in Tehran. It was taken in a Iranian school right here in good old Houston, Texas. With the influx of so-called migrants at our southern border, who knows how many terrorists are actually in the United States. Number 17, the third temple. Well, the first temple was Solomon's temple, completed around 970 B.C. The second temple was Zerubbabel's temple, completed in 516 B.C. This temple was also called Herod's temple at the time of Christ because Herod did a makeover to garner favor with the Jews. The third temple will be the tribulation temple, built early in the seven-year tribulation. And the fourth temple will be the millennial temple built during the millennial kingdom as described in Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48. Throughout the past 1900 years of exile, the Jewish people longed to return to Israel, build the third temple in Jerusalem, and restore the temple service and worship. The Temple Institute has 500 trained priests, a high priest, the Sanhedrin, 
and all the temple implements of worship and priestly garments completed. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, speaking of the Antichrist, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The Antichrist will agree to the rebuilding of the third temple because he wants to sit in it for just this reason, to proclaim himself God. Number 18, the red heifer. Numbers 19, verse 2. This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord hath commanded, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring thee a red heifer without spot, wherein is no blemish, and upon which never came yoke. An unblemished, pure red heifer is the key ingredient to temple worship. Israel has four qualified red heifers. They are now old enough for sacrifice. The red heifer is required for ceremonial purification. A red heifer is to be sacrificed as a burnt offering, and the ashes of that offering mixed with water from the pool of Siloam for a purification water. This purification water is necessary to purify the newly rebuilt temple so it can be ceremonially clean for worship. Israel originally received five red heifers from a farmer here in Texas at the cost of $100,000 each, but subsequently one of them has grown some either black hairs or white hairs and rendered itself impure. Notice that the red heifers do not have an ear tag. During COVID, for some reason, farmers stopped marking their cattle with ear tags for a short time, and this worked out to Israel's favor because had it been marked with an ear tag, it would have been unclean. The Lord truly works in mysterious ways, doesn't he? So Israel has everything they need to rebuild and sanctify the tribulation temple. Number 19, apostasy. Days of Noah, days of Lot. First Timothy 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The folks you see there on the left are two men from the United Methodist Church in Charleston, South Carolina, displaying their, looks like prayer shawls, with the uh, pride colors on them. The folks on the right are from the All Saints Church in Pasadena, California. Looks like a happy bunch, but I really do feel sorry for them because they have no idea the judgment that awaits them. The acceptance of homosexuality in the church is a clear sign of the end times apostasy during this present dispensation of grace. Luke chapter 17, verses 28 to 30. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. That would be the second coming. We see these end time events right before our eyes on a regular daily basis. Number 20 the pre-trib rapture teaching waning. More and more pastors and teachers are departing from the pre-tribulation rapture teaching. I guess they're afraid they might offend somebody. Many pastors don't even teach about the rapture at all. They probably don't even believe it. Many say that the pre-tribulation rapture is an invention of John Darby in the 1800s. But John Darby did not invent the pre-tribulation rapture. He merely revived it from being suppressed for 1,500 years by the Church of Rome. Others say that he got it from a vision from Margaret MacDonald, a young child in Scotland. But if you've ever read her account, she mentions nothing whatsoever about a pre-trib rapture. In fact, if you read her account, it seems like she's talking about a post-trib rapture, if anything. But the pre-trib rapture is true, and it is what the Bible teaches. Sadly, many today are Bible users and not Bible believers. They merely use the Bible to find verses here and there to support their presuppositions 
and their false teachings. Be a Bible believer, not merely a Bible user. Romans 16, verse 17, the Apostle Paul writes, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. What doctrine is Paul talking about? His doctrine, his doctrine that he teaches, and his doctrine that we have learned. Mark them which depart from Paul's doctrine, and avoid them. Number 20. Okay, we're going to stop there, and next week we'll do number 21 to number 27. Very interesting, eh? Very interesting. And now we're going to start the Bible study. This chapter has only seven verses, I believe, but I've done what I can to extract as much as I can out of it and to give you an opportunity to interact a little more than usual. So let me begin with Revelation 15, beginning at verse 1. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them, watch this statement here, the wrath of God is complete. Now these are the seven last judgments which are given to these angels in bowls. Look at the size of these bowls. You know, for a long time, I thought the bowls were the size of soup bowls. I had this image of salad bowls, but I never thought of bowls this size. So that just indicates the intensity of the judgment. Please, somebody's clanging back there. Would you turn off your microphones, please? Make sure everybody's muted. Now, each of these bowls contains a terrible judgment. And after they're poured out, the anger of God on men and women on earth is complete. And that should bring a lot of concern to every one of us because we're so close to it. Obviously, as I've said last week, and I say it again this week, grace has now run out. And it's run out completely in chapter 15. In chapter 15, the Lord's patience with sin has come to an end because everything that might have led to repentance has been administered. So in spite of the Lord doing all he can to reach people, many will still hang on to their sin. Some will be saved, but many will still hang on to their sin. And by chapter 15, nobody's going to be saved. The number will be complete. Here are the three things that the Lord has done to reach people. First of all, he gave us the law under Moses, which constituted the entire Old Testament. Then the new covenant under Jesus with his shed blood on the cross and his resurrection. And then finally, the great harvest and the word of God, which is being preach to the world right now and uh, letting people know what's coming and hopefully many of them will respond we need to pray for our lost loved ones our friends and our colleagues as much as possible because they can't come to jesus apart from the work of the father and we participate in that work by praying to the father to have mercy on those that we love and those that we know but they will refuse to repent this is chapter 15 of revelation now they refuse to repent. The judgment of God will not do anything to them because they're so set in their ways. Because by chapter 15 of Revelation, nothing can change them now. It's just too late. And John, the apostle, caused this great and marvelous. Now, personally, on the basis of the English words alone, I don't feel this is marvelous at all. I think the judgment of God is sad, tragic, and pitiful. What's going to happen to people doesn't make me happy at all. So I decided to look up the Greek word for marvelous. And I found out that the Greek word for marvelous in this context is called thagmasios. Now, the word thagma, by the way, I am Greek for those of you that have come on who are new. I am Greek, so I read the Bible in Greek, I write in Greek, and I speak Greek. Thagmasios means something miraculous, something awesome, something breathtaking, and at the same time, something terrible. So that pretty well summarizes the judgments of God. They are miraculous, they are awesome. They are breathtaking, and they are also terrible. But even in the light of these awesome judgments, some will still not repent. So we should not be surprised at the resistance that people display right now as we share the gospel with them. Because personally, I'm shocked at the stubbornness of people who are in sin and the evil that is in their hearts. And it leads me to say that Jesus was right when he said in John chapter 3, 17 to 21, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, listen carefully, that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. That explains the resistance. 
But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. So for me, it's mind-boggling, and it's mind-boggling to many other believers, how people can be so blind to the truth, how easily they believe a lie, how quickly they will worship anything and anybody except the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, they'll fall into all kinds of crazy spiritualism and religions, everything except Jesus. And that is the essence of our, of our sin nature. We're, the sin nature is foolish. The sin nature is stubborn, self-sufficient, ignorant, hostile towards God. The sin nature is a denier of the truth. The sin nature is oblivious to the reality of God. It's incapable of embracing Jesus as Lord and Savior. And the sin nature feels totally justified in doing so. Now, here are some of the stupid excuses <laughs> unbelievers give you that frustrate you to no end. And I'm going to ask you to give a response. But I'm not going to do them one at a time. I'm going to read them all. Then we'll go back and do them one at a time. And I'm going to ask some of you to give me an answer, give me a response to these objections. You've, I'm sure you've heard this as you've shared your faith. There is no God. Let him do a miracle for me right now, and I will believe in him. I'll worry about judgment when I get there. I will confront the Lord and tell him, why didn't you provide more evidence? Oh, the Bible is just a book of myths. Besides, science has disproven it. I don't need your God. I don't need your Jesus. That's your truth. I have my own truth. If there is a heaven, we're all going there anyway. What makes your religion better than all the others? There are many ways to God. I have plenty of time. Don't force your religion on me. Oh, I believe in God already. I'm just fine. I'm Jewish, Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, atheist. I just don't believe in your God. And by the way, why is there so much evil in the world? If God was good, he would do something about it. If he was loving and all-powerful, he would not tolerate evil. And now I'm going to ask you for your responses. So let's start with the first one. There is no God. Let him do a miracle for me right now, and I will believe in him. Jeffrey, what would you say to that? First of all, he's made a blank statement. There is no God, so that's a dangerous thing to yeah. say that. You know, presume he knows everything. And secondly, that we have the Lord Jesus Christ came as a man, God in the human flesh, and he died on the cross. And even then, when he was on earth, people did not believe him, believe, have faith in God, in him. Okay, so what would you so say? example. What would you say, Judy, to the charge? Oh, let him do a miracle for me right now, and I'll believe. Don't forget to turn on your microphone. Your microphone, Judy. Thank you. Oh, wait. I'd say that's not true because it already happened in the Bible, and the I think it was Jesus himself that said that, or Paul, I'm not sure, that said that it already happened, and they didn't believe. That's right. It's all through the Bible. Miracles happened. and I think they, that was with Lazarus. Yeah, they didn't believe. And I've said many times that if miracles brought people to Jesus or brought people to God, Egypt would be the most spiritual nation on the face of the earth. <laughs> because after Israel, they saw more miracles than anybody else. Okay, let's go down to our second objection, which is here. The second objection is, I will worry about judgment when I get there. What would you say to that, Oliver? I will worry about the judgment when I get there. Oliver, what would you say to that? Well, judgment can happen right now. Okay. You don't know if you're gonna die. You don't know how long you have to live. Yeah. And the minute you the minute you take your last breath, you take your last heartbeat, you come before the the judge of judges, and he's gonna judge you whether you're you're going to heaven or not, whether you know Jesus Christ or not. Okay. How about Steve? Well, what would you say if someone said, I'll talk to the Lord, I'll confront him, and I'll tell him, Why didn't you provide more evidence? And I would have believed in you. But not enough evidence. What would you say, Steve? Say there's enough evidence. Uh, there is the the nation of Israel. Uh -huh. We have archaeologists, uh, artifacts. The Bible, we can uh, see in the Bible the location, the geographic location of nation. Through the Bible, we can see the origins of the war. Uh -huh. If we trace the origins of nations, the origins of people, of languages, it is all in the Bible. The Bible explains everything. Uh, okay. Man, woman, everything. Okay, that's great. What about this one? 
The Bible is a book of myths, and besides, science, is, science has disproven it. What would you say, John Cardos? The Bible is a book of myths, and science has disproven it. What would you say, John? Turn on your microphone. Oop, I think we lost him. Yep. Okay, Marie, what would you say to a man who says, oh, the Bible's full of myths and science has disproven it anyway? Marie. Turn on your mic. Okay. Um, can you repeat that question one more time? Sorry. The Bible is a book of myths, and besides, science has disproven it. I would just say that science hasn't disproven it because... Um, there's plenty of evidence to prove that it hasn't. Well, are you able to cite me one evidence that science has? Um, just the planets, the sun, the moon, just how it's mentioned in the Bible, creation. Okay, that's good enough. Thank you very much, Marie. That'll do. That'll do. Okay. Go to the next one. Jamie, what would you say to someone who says, I don't need your God, I don't need your Jesus? What would you say, Jamie? I would just feel um, really sad for them, honestly, just because when you know God and you have that relationship with God and that you know connected spirit, there's no denying that there isn't a God. So for somebody to make a statement like that is somebody who's never experienced or had a real relationship with Jesus. So I, you know, I would just feel kind of devastated for them, to be honest. Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much. And Christina, what would you say to someone who says, let me just check my thing. We're all going to heaven anyway. Everybody's going to heaven. Nobody's going to hell. There is no hell. What would you say, Christina? Hmm. Uh-huh. See, I want to train you guys to be able to give answers to those who yeah. ask for the open. Yeah. Well, that's, what it's, this, that's what this is all about. It's not to embarrass you. It's not to put I, you I on don't the know. I feel like I would be like, well, what? We're all going to, everybody's going what to heaven. What makes your mind say... That because if you're saying only heaven exists and everyone's going to heaven, then you're telling me murderers and rapists are also going to heaven. That's like exactly exactly what they're telling you. Okay, that's a good answer. That's a good answer. Itzak, what would you say to someone who says, That's your truth, but I have my own truth? What would you say to that man? It means uh, that they don't trust Jesus and his teachings. If uh, he seems to believe on their own gods like uh, Muslims to Hindus to Okay, they don't believe in Jesus and he is the way, the truth, and the life. And yeah. no one comes to the Father but by him. All right, was... on the right, okay, okay, great. Now, Justin, what would you say to what does your why is uh, what makes your religion better than the others? Justin, what would you say to that? What makes your religion better than all the others? What's the difference? There's no, there's not necessarily, uh, it's not, it's not a question of whether it's better or not. It's just whether it's the truth. Whether it's the truth. Yeah. Okay. Very good. All right, Joseph, this one's for you. What would you say to someone who would say to you, there are many ways to God. There are many ways to God. What would you say? Joseph. Well, I just give them the simple truth that the Bible says that, uh, Jesus is the only way to heaven because he is the only, uh, the, the way, the truth, and the life. And uh, there has been no other book that has been uh, proven through the ages. And it's still so, and um, despite of uh, what happened uh, uh, throughout the years, it is the one and only um proof okay that indeed what what um what it says about it or what jesus says about the it is the word of god and had and has been proven okay it's the is. only one the only one all right that's good i'll take that and not only that but if the other religions are ways to god then jesus is a liar because he said mm -hmm. he's the only way faustina what would you say to someone who says, I have plenty of time before I accept Jesus as my savior. I'm going to live my life. And when, it, when I get to the end, then I'll accept him. What would you say? Is 
Is Faustina there? That's the first thing. Oh, no, Faustina's not here anymore. Oh, yeah, there she is. So what would you say to someone, Faustina? Don't forget to turn on your microphone. Last time on. Okay. So what would you say to someone who says, I got all the time in the world. I don't need to accept him now. What would you say? First and foremost, we don't know the time. Mm -hmm. We don't know how long we will live. Mm -hmm. The moment the person saying that the next minute, he doesn't know what will happen to them. No, you don't. So yes. Yeah, so you have to change your mind and be ready. Okay. You got to be ready because the Bible says today is the day of salvation. All right, very good. And of course, the other ones, I'm sure you can answer those. I'm a Hindu, I'm a Buddhist, I'm a Muslim, etc. I just don't believe in your God. But here's a tough one. How come there's so much evil in the world? Doesn't Why doesn't God do something about all the evil in the world? What would you say, John, to that? John Carter. Well, I can, I can say one thing. He did, did do something about it. Yeah, what did he do? That's why he sent Jesus. Oh. Because we, we were fallen. And, and the world is evil because we departed from God. And because we departed from God, he sent help. Okay, great. So Wonderful. Free gift. Anybody can have it. But if you refuse to take it, that's the, that's where you end up. That's okay. it. Okay. And Steve, what would you say? Why is there so much evil in the world? Why doesn't God do something about it? Um, God has already done something about it. Yeah. Uh, there was evil in the world since the time of Cain uh, until today. They have always been evil. But God has provided a solution, a way out, and that's Jesus. If you believe in Jesus, you will restrain the evil. So the evil will not be abundant. There will be less evil if many people believe in Jesus. Okay. And Lise, what would you say? Not Lisa, but Lise, what would you say? How come there's so much evil in the world? Why doesn't God do something about it? I would say because he has given us free will, but he's also given us a way out and the protection. So we do have a choice. He doesn't force us, but through his love, he does offer us an opportunity to have a better life and be protected from those who don't choose him. Okay. And now, Lisa, what would you say to someone who says, oh, there's so much evil. Why doesn't God do something about it? Um, I would say that he never promised that there was not going to be bad or you no know, evil in this world. Um, he didn't promise us that. So there's going to be that. And out of that, he always can turn evil into good. And that has a chance to show his goodness through the evil. Wonderful. That's a great answer. And now what I would say, what I usually say is he's done something about it and he's going to do something about it. The first time he did something about it, he changed the hearts of men. He made it possible for evil to be extracted from the hearts of men through his death on the cross. The next time he does something about evil, he's going to wipe it all out. And you don't want to be included in that wipeout. That's my answer. He's done something about it, and he's about to do something about it. And you won't be very happy when he does something about it the second time. Okay. Very good answers. Wonderful. I'm proud of you guys. All right. You never realize how blessed you are to know Jesus until you try to lead someone to the Lord and they simply don't get it. I'm sure we've all been in that situation. And that reinforces the following verses. Check them out. John 6, 44, Jesus speaking, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. So yes, you send the message, but only the spirit of God can make the change. Second Corinthians 4, 4 talks about the devil whose mind the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of God, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So the enemy has something to do with it too. Then there's Isaiah 6, 8 to 10. And I like this one very much. I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. This is Isaiah speaking. And now the Lord answers, Go and tell this people, listen to this, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. That describes human nature. Keep on seeing but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes. Let they see with their eyes and hear with their ears. And that's why it's so important for us to pray for people and understand with their heart and return and be healed. So if that's the case, if people are so stubborn, why bother telling people about Jesus at all? Well, there's a reason. Romans 8, 12 to 17, where there is no distinction between Jew and Greek for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
How then, here it comes. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in whom of, in how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? There we go. And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. I think we need to accept that, that not everybody is going to accept the gospel when we preach it. For Isaiah has said, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And then, of course, the reason that we tell people is because of the Great Commission. Mark 16, 15 to 20. And he, Jesus, said to them, go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Some will believe. But he who does not believe will be condemned. Others will not believe. And these signs shall follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take out serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere. The, wor the Lord working with them and confirming the word through accompanying signs. Amen. And that ended the Gospel of Mark. Verse 2 of Revelation 15. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works. There's that word marvelous again. Agmasios, Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of the saints, who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name. For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. So the saints of God celebrate Jesus throughout the entire tribulation. There's a lot of worship going on, a lot of celebration, a lot of rejoicing, even as the world is being judged. And in this case, these people, these saints, which I think are the tribulation saints personally, they celebrate the judgments of God as just and true. And this is just before he pours out his, for, his fierce tribulation, uh, his, I'm sorry, this is just before he pours out his fierce retribution on the whole world by bringing everything to a swift end. So I have a question here to ask you. Do these terrible judgments sit well with you? How do you feel about God judging the world? Can you justify God's anger against the world? Is he right to judge mankind with such ferocity? Jeffrey, is the Lord right to judge people with such vengeance and wrath? Yes. When he considered he gave his son Jesus Christ, that we should believe in Jesus Christ and be saved from the world. And he and Jesus suffered a great deal because he had no he did no wrong for us then that would make God justified in judging the world because of the punishment of the world was poured on Jesus Christ, who did no wrong. Okay, and what about you, Justin? Do you think the Lord is right to judge the world the way he's going to? Uh, yes. And the reason? It's his call. It's his call. Yeah, that's true. You've been saying that now for the last couple of weeks. He sets the rules, and it's his call. What about you, Jamie? How do you feel about all these judgments? Do you think they're just and right and true? Absolutely, because he is just and right and true. Yeah, he is. And you, Marie, what do you think? Marie? Yes, I think, I, yeah, I had to unmute. Um, yes, I think it's just and true. He, um, He's the creator of everything. He owns everything. Yeah, like Justin it, it, said. Everything belongs to him. That's right. Like Justin says, he sets the rules. He makes the call. Yeah. What about you, Steve? What would you say? Is God right and is he just to judge the world to such a degree? What do you think? Yes, he's just, he's righteous in his judgment. And uh, he's sovereign. He created everything. Uh, and he has power to take life. And he has power to give life. So yeah, that's right. Uh, he's sovereign over all his creation. He does what he wants. Okay, now my answer would be, if somebody would ask me that, is God just and true to rain all these judgments that are coming? I would say, I'm surprised he hasn't done it already. <laughs> he's, 
he's taken so long. He shows such patience, a lot more patience than I would show, because if I were God, I would have wiped out everybody by now. So thank God I'm not God and he is. <laughs> well, anyway, we move on. Thanks, everybody. Good answers. Good answers. Uh, let me just get rid of this. Thank you. There we go. Verse 5. After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And out of the temple came seven angels having the seven plagues, clothed in bright, pure linen, and having their chests girded with golden bands. Now the tabernacle of heaven has been opened ever since Jesus died on the cross for our sins. If you remember, the veil of the temple on earth, the tabernacle, was symbolic of the tabernacle in heaven, and it was torn in two from the top down by the hand of God, which signified that the way to the Father, which had been closed since the beginning of time, was now open because of what Jesus did. But here, the tabernacle in heaven is open to provide access to the angels to put an end to the world. So this is not about redemption anymore. The tabernacle is now open to pour out judgment on the world. And one of the living creatures that we looked at in Revelation chapter 4, representing the Lord Jesus, gives the angels bowls containing absolutely horrible judgments from which there is no escape. Look at verse 7. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Now that's interesting, this section right here. No one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Here's a great artist's depiction of it. There's the living creature with the face of a lion. And here are the seven angels lined up to receive their bowls of judgment. And in this case, the bowls are a little smaller. And that's the image I had, but I think they're probably bigger than that. Now, access to the Lord is shut down temporarily in this case, because the only thing on God's mind now in Revelation 15 is to finish off the sinful dark, dark world and usher in his kingdom. Now, this is so tragic so sad, so awful, it ought to inspire all of us to be more diligent in sharing our faith. At the very least, it should motivate every one of us to go all out for Jesus so that we can each be prepared for his coming. My last question, and this finishes the Bible study, how close do you think we are to the end, Oliver? I think we're very close to the end because Jesus said, in uh, Matthew 24, in Mark 13, and in Luke 21, that when there's going to be wars, rumors of wars, pestilences, famines, and earthquakes, and all these things are coming on like birth pangs, then the end is near. Okay. And that's exactly what we're going through right now. Okay, Lise, are we close to the end? What do you think? Well, I think no one knows the time except the Father, but we can certainly see the signs and the way things are going with the attack on the children and, and the women and all that. We can see that it, it's got to be near an end. It okay, has thank to be. You. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. What about you, Faustina? Are we close to the end, in your opinion? Faustina, don't forget to open your mic. Yes, I think we're close to the end because reading and uh, knowing uh, the book of Revelation and seeing what's going on, the war, the diseases, the flood, the fire, it, it, it's all in the Bible. So Okay. Justin, are we close to the end as far as you're concerned? Uh, yep. Yep. Okay. Judy, are we close to the end? Well, it all depends what you call close. I would say uh, giving it a, a date would be 2025 to 2032. Oh, really? Oh. <laughs> so how's okay. that for close? You got, you got guts. What can I say? What about you, Jamie? Are we close? Jamie, are we close? To the I, I would say we are closer than yesterday. Yesterday, well, very funny, very funny, very funny. <laughs> no one knows it, but they say that, you know, you will see the signs in the... And the sun and the stars and the sky, like all these things. So we can, you know, speculate that we are a lot closer. But um, I have to just say we're closer than we are yesterday because oh. no one knows. Okay. What about you, Itzak? Are we close to the end in your opinion? Yes, we are very close to, uh, to the end because every sign that 
that is in the bible we are seeing today in our words like wars natural disaster everything uh, it's like while you're on i want to ask you how are the christians doing in pakistan how are they doing our brothers and sisters how's everything going yes. in pakistan yes they are suffering from many op oppression yeah. like people do not treat them well Okay, so we'll we'll keep them in prayer, definitely. Marie, yes. are we, thank you. They need prayers. Okay, Marie, are we close to the end in your opinion? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we have things in the Bible that tell us prophecies like um, the Euphrates River is drying up, um, just everything that's been going on, Israel at war. So I I think so. I mean, well, I definitely know we're at the end of end of times, but like. Are we really, really close? I kind of feel like we are, but I just, I don't know. Okay, Steve, what do you think? Are we really close? I think uh, uh, we are the last generation from 1948. So uh, we have come to uh, 2048. Okay. I think that's how close we are. All right. What about you, John? What do you think? Are we close? We, we are marrying and giving in marriage as in the days of Noah, so are these days. Yeah. And it'll be a surprise because it'll come like a thief in the night. Yeah. We'll look like everything's okay and it'll come by surprise. Okay. Jeffrey, what do you think? Are we close? Is a clock called, called it's, it's the doomsday clock. Yes. And I think we are now at two seconds to midnight. Oh, wonderful. That's great. <laughs> Two seconds to midnight. Well, we're close. Christina, are we close? I'd say so. I have a question. Is there a way we can still find out like which tribes and nations and tongues have not heard the gospel yet? Yes, we, there is. Uh, not too many. Maybe less than 10 now. Okay. All right. Joseph, are we close? Yes. And uh, I'm surprised that uh, it didn't happen uh, yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> you see, you hear that, Jamie? Uh, He's surprised it didn't happen yesterday. Uh, no, but in my opinion, being the just and fair God that He is, uh, He He didn't uh, allow this to happen, you know, like uh, sooner. But He's still giving a chance for everyone, because that's His will that none of us should be lost. And that's why I believe, however, just like a, a woman in travail, she knows, uh, we do know that uh, she is about to deliver the baby because of the signs. And Jesus stated that clearly, yeah. that these are the signs. And then all of them, and I don't see anything here that's missing. It's like a, a perfect uh, yeah. uh, recipe. Uh, the ingredients are all there. Yeah, you're right. I agree with you 100%. Nothing more needs to happen for the rapture to come. Nothing. Everything's been done. And I couldn't say that 20 years ago, and I couldn't say that when I first got saved. But nothing more needs to happen. Everything is set in place. So we'll see. Any day now. So that's it for the Bible study for this week. Thank you for listening. I'm going to ask Christina to close in prayer. Christina, would you close in prayer, please? Father God, thank you for another awesome Bible study and for continuing to train us up, Father um, for all the unbelievers that will come at us with all of these um, excuses, Father God, just continue to prepare our hearts and continue to open up those opportunities, Lord, and fill up our mouths, Holy Spirit, with what we what we should say when we need to say it, Father God. And we just thank you for your Holy Spirit who so graciously comes to help us out, Father. You are after souls, Lord, and we just continue to lift up everyone around the globe, God, that does not know you yet, that you would... Draw them in, Lord. Draw them in, Lord, and continue to strengthen your children all over the globe, Father God. So thank you for my brothers and sisters here tonight, Lord. Bless each one and everyone connected to them. Until next time, Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a wonderful weekend. Resurrection Sunday. God bless yes. you. Bye. Happy good Resurrection night. Day. Bye -bye. Have a wonderful Bye. time. Good God night bless. and God bless everybody. See you, see you soon. Bye now. God bless. Bye -bye. God bless. Bye. Thank Bye. you.